Welcome back, Ford Explorers. Before we get into this week's episode, a part two of last week's episode. If you haven't watched that already, go ahead and do that. It's really good. But we want to make sure you tune into our social medias. We got the Instagram, we got the Twitter, we got the Patreon, and let's not forget about our hotline. Usually we tell you a story, but we want you to tell us a story. So if you have pictures, videos, or just a nice long message, Send it to us. Tell us your story. We secretly have an Indian TikTok where we <laughs> post them all and people just have no idea. We're huge over there. Shout out to our Bengali listeners. So hit us up on the hotline, follow us on social media, and enjoy today's episode. See you guys. Welcome back, Ford Explorers. Did another episode. You ask at Spirit Hour. This is episode, I think, like 42 now. Something like that. Which, you know, according to Douglas Adams, answer to everything. Yes. Yeah. In case you guys have ever wondered, you read the Hitchhiker's Guide. Uh, I am the Colonel. This is Caleb. Uh, how are you, Caleb? I'm good. We had some spooky stuff happen. Um, I had an outside entity acknowledge that there was spooky stuff happening last night at work. <laughs> that, 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 that sounds like you had a seance to yeah. ask about other ghosts. No, no, no. Uh, it was a like patron. You got an old reliable one. It was a regular at the bar. I was talking to my psychic, and she was like, yeah, there are definitely ghosts in there. Uh, it was regular at the bar. He was one of the only people in because it was towards us closing down. and Not for good, just no. for the evening. <laughs> he just kept looking over. He's like, I keep feeling like there's someone sitting in that booth over there. He's like, I keep looking, no one is. And I was like, oh, it's because this place is 100% haunted. <laughs> and he's like, what? And I was like, yeah, I always see things in my peripheral. He's like, yeah, it really feels like someone's sitting in that booth just staring at me. And I'm like, I'm glad to hear someone else say it. I mean, if the, I've said it before, and I will continue to say it, but if ghosts exist, we got them. Yeah. Well, the thing is, so he was like, hey, there feels like someone's sitting in that booth. Backlights never changed once yesterday. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. So the lights didn't change, but someone in the outside felt that someone was sitting there. Well, and we've had more than one person feel like there's somebody sitting at the bar in the booths mm -hmm. right there. Yeah. Definitely feels like somebody's at least happy there's a bar there. Yeah. It feels like they take a load like, off. Finally, this place has been empty forever. <laughs> it's like, I worked here, I died here a hundred years ago, and I have been waiting for a bar. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's our happy haunted little bar. Yeah. Uh, headlines for this week. The tradition lives on. You want to start with one of your headlines? Yeah, uh, so researchers at Purdue University. Uh, Good old Purdue. They got the Guinness World Record uh, recently for developing the world's whitest paint. <laughs> um, the professor, he's a professor of mechanical engineering in Purdue. Uh, the aim of the project was to make a paint that they could paint buildings with to reflect sunlight. And lower energy usage. Yeah. So you paint your building bright white, doesn't absorb as much heat from the sun. You don't have to spend as much energy cooling your building. The uh, that's what, Yeah, that's why you can wear long sleeves all the time. Exactly. Uh, the, the Spanish, uh, listen to me, the Spanish villas, the, but like the seaside villas and stuff on the Mediterranean, a lot of them, because they're older and they're built out of not exactly adobe, but mm -hmm. eff effectively similar yeah. construction, uh, they're all painted white, like bright white. And a lot of them have rules that you have to continuously paint them white. And it's not just so they'll look nice. And so that they'll uh, wick off the heat as well. It's a pretty effective, I mean, ask anybody... Who's ever owned a black car in a hot state? What the difference yeah. is, you know what I mean? 100%. Yeah. Um, this, the the main component that makes it this bright white is barium sulfate. Um, and it has a side effect, which is the reflectiveness because of that barium sulfate. So it was like, we were just trying to make this reflective paint and it ended up being the whitest paint. <laughs> so they're like, it's a win-win situation. <laughs> But now I'm just glad that there's paint out there that someone can accurately paint a portrait of me and have my skin tone right. <laughs> I'm glad you said it and I didn't have to. Yeah, I would imagine that for research they just took a, an up-close picture of your butt and they're like, there we go, that's the whitest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> well, uh, you know full well, speaking of our haunted little bar, we have a tradition around that haunted little bar called Goof of the Day. Yes. Goof of the Day is something that I started doing when I used to employ a bunch of butt heads who were competitive <laughs> about everything to the extent that they wouldn't admit if they had done something wrong. So I decided to just make doing wrong a competition. Uh, and 
Goof of the Day, I know you've heard this a hundred times, but for listeners at home, uh, is a daily competition. So whoever makes the largest mistake wins Goof of the Day. I have Goof of the Day with this Texas report. Uh, two pilots ejected out of a fighter jet that was, they were doing standard rounds uh, over a neighborhood. They ran into mechanical air, ejected out of the plane. The plane landed in the, ho- in the homes in the neighborhood in, in suburban Texas. And to make it even better, one of the pilots got stuck in the power lines on the way down. Yeah, you, you sent this article to me and like, one guy, his parachute, they were too low for their parachutes to be super effective. So they both got seriously injured Yeah, uh, because they're just hitting the ground at real fast speeds. One guy, uh, someone just found the dude in their backyard. Like, he just <laughs> fucking planted in the backyard. And, yeah, the other guy, full-on Invisible Man a la Deadpool 2, just yeah. got fucking zapped in the power lines. It's, it's devastating. We shouldn't laugh as They're both as fine. As well, as cleared up. They're both I mean, fine. They're not fine, but they're I alive. Mean, yeah, they're alive. <laughs> yeah. Speaking I mean, of... Goof yeah. of the day, though. Damn. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and speaking of being alive... Speaking of being alive, Japanese sisters, uh, my second article, were just dubbed... The oldest twins, uh, again, another Guinness record, uh, two twins, they were 107 years old in 300 days. That's amazing. They're now officially the oldest living twins. Um, they were both born in 1913. <laughs> one was born in 1913, the other one was born in 1975. <laughs> they were uh, both born. <laughs> I'd say fire the copywriter, but it's you. Yeah, uh, yeah, but they were born in 1913. Um they are from Japan and they're old as shit. That's like all there is to the story. That's <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Great. The telling of that story was even as better than the story. Well, the, my last little uh, story is less um, a headline, I guess, and more just a funny anecdote. So we struggle a lot with the YouTube algorithm, obviously, because we uh, swear and we use terms that they don't enjoy a whole lot. We also cover sensitive subjects yeah. uh, and subjects that get uh, blurred a lot, so it's pretty easy for us to get flagged. Well, uh, in what I think is probably the funniest flagging they've done, uh, the Ig Nobel Awards are my favorite annual science awards. They started in 2015, and it's like a it's an award where scientists who put the most work into something that doesn't necessarily push mankind any f- further forward, yeah. but is something novel. Like, uh, I think he was a Dane researcher, uh, won an award this year because he spent all of 2020 analyzing how cats converse, all of their different sounds, and uh, he found a lot of really interesting stuff, but again, doesn't really help the progress of man. Yeah. Well, they had their ceremony on YouTube uh, and the other night, and it was flagged and taken down because they used a tiny portion of a song from 1914, <laughs> which if YouTube doesn't understand, like, nothing quite proves the efficacy, or I guess not efficacy, but the need for the Ig Nobel Awards, quite like YouTube taking it down for something so in- insignificant. So like, yes, that is the point here. Yeah. Correct. It is supposed to be fun. But I just wanted to include, anytime we can get another good example of YouTube being dumb with their calls, I think is a good one. I just saw an Ig Nobel thing. Uh, a guy was researching if transporting rhinoceroses after they've been tranquilized, like taking them from rehabilitation centers back to the wild or vice versa, uh, they usually transport them upside down. He tested to see if that had a negative effect on them. Um, it didn't. <laughs> and he got an Ig Nobel Prize. <laughs> but it's good to know that. Yeah. You know? They feel like insignificant pieces of science, but like, <sighs> science is a big thing. Yeah. You know, like, it, you could say the same thing about the design of the cup holder in your car, but I bet if it was the wrong shape, you'd be upset. Uh, it is. Mine doesn't have cup holders. <laughs> yeah. What I've noticed about living where I do now is that none of the cup holders are quite large enough for the cups they give you. Uh, anyway, so today is exciting. Today we're getting into uh, part two, but it's we didn't make it a formal two part episode because. Uh, the connection is part of the story, yeah. but it's also by the nature of the stories on this show, it's going to be a little dubious. Mm-hmm. So the two stories are definitely connected thematically. They're both about rock apes. Um, they just might also be quite literally tied in that one of the rock apes that we talked about last week, last week, if you guys missed the show, you definitely should go back and check it out before you listen to this one. Um, but it's a lot of fun. We talked about um, the Sasquatch sightings during the Vietnam War and before that and the role that rock apes the Sasquatch, the wild men there, uh, might play in both the culture and society and where they might actually still live in a more believable fashion than just good old-fashioned, well, they're in the trees. Although we are really, based on what we're learning, I'm 
I think they can fly. I, they can <laughs> I know fly. what I'm saying, but boy, it feels like mm-hmm. they can fly because that sure comes up a lot. So today we're talking about a very specific uh, Sasquatch, a very specific ape man, and that is the Minnesota Iceman. Yes, the Minnesota Iceman. Yes, the ice, the Iceman of Minnesota. Um, Minnesota Iceman is a specific Sasquatch or rock ape, like you said. Yep. Um, he has some specific characteristics, that being uh, a male, human-like, at least six feet tall. Um, hairy with large hands and feet, dark brown reddish hair, uh, about three to four inches long on the hair, with a flattened nose and furrowed brow. And the most uh, tantalizing detail is that he's in a frozen block of ice Yes, and (laughs) used to be on display at county fairs, state fairs, uh, sideshows, and we're not talking, you know, with our stories, sometimes we have a tendency to talk about uh, the 1800s, a long, long time ago, Mm -hmm. too long ago for reference sometimes, but today we're talking about the 60s and the 70s. This is in 1968. Uh, So Fred Hansen, the owner of this uh, alleged rock ape, kept it in a big block of ice. You want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so uh, Frank Hansen, he went around, he was in the Air Force, Uh, he retired in 68, and he quickly got bored of civilian life. And before you uh, draw your own conclusions, we'll get to it, but yes, he did serve in Vietnam. Yes, he did serve in Vietnam. But he was sitting there, and he was just just bored with life. He lived on a ranch with his family, and he was like, I don't know what to do. He served 20 years in the military, just got bored, and so he started doing the state and county fair tour circuit. Which is the funniest thing to Yeah. Me. Like, as a kid, you know, 4-H and stuff. I even used to do, like, the Lego... Uh, competitions mm-hmm. at the fair, uh, and I won quite a few. I'll have you know, uh, you know. So the idea of doing it like as a lifestyle is really fun to me. So he happened to own at the time the oldest John Deere tractor, um, and he actually what an loaned honor. it. What an honor. He actually loaned it to the Smithsonian while he was in the military, and he got bored and he was talking to a guy, and the guy's like, "Well, you should do what I do." He's like, "I collect cars, but I know you have that tractor. You should take it on a state fair tour." And so he did. He did that for a while, and he realized it just wasn't making money. Well, like, yeah, because it's a tractor. <laughs> it's a really old tractor, and it's kind of boring. Yeah, it's like a novel, you know, thing for two seconds. But uh, also, it's the fair. Yeah, you know, like they also don't serve healthy food at the fair. You know, it's a serotonin fest out there. Yeah. So he was like, "I need something that'll draw in some big bucks." And so he turns to the guy and he says, "Well, what if I had like a fully preserved Bigfoot slash Neanderthal?" <laughs> and the guy's like. Yeah, that'd be amazing. I don't know where you'd get your hands on that. And he's like, good to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So a couple well, months yeah, go past. Me neither. <laughs> a couple months go past, and uh, he has this tractor trailer that says, uh, the incredible Minnesota Iceman, uh, Homo Pogonidus? Pogodius. Yeah. Pogodius, yeah. Pogodies nuts. Pogodies nuts. <laughs> uh, and he... Licensed it as the missing link, what linked us from Homo erectus to human beings as Homo we know sapiens. now. Homo yeah, sapien. Yeah. Um, and he went on this whole tour uh, circuit, and people were amazed. They're like, this is a six-foot-tall Sasquatch frozen in a 6,000-pound block of ice encased in this refrigerated glass coffin on display, and I can just stand here and look at it. Yeah, and, you know, and this is it, – it is not – it should be said that the age of the roadside attraction was definitely the 50s and the 60s. Oh, yeah. As Route 66 was being finished. You know, I grew up on the West Coast on, on Route 66, and you can drive up and down it. And there's still, whether it's an old one or it's, you know, been kept up, there are so many roadside attractions. And there are so many that are things like this. It's mm-hmm. a room that you got to pay to go through a curtain, and then you look through a glass box into something, and allegedly that's a monster. Yeah. Yeah. But this one was a little more convincing than most, that's for sure. Yeah, and it was uh, in a very particular pose. Uh, audio listeners, I'll explain it to you. Video listeners, I'll show you. He was laying there, feet together, with his I'll left also, arm. I'll also put it behind. Yeah, us. yeah. <laughs> kind of up around his head with his back or head back. And a discernible feature that you could see is the <laughs> that his wiener's in his hand. His wiener is in his hand. In every picture and drawing, just his wiener's just straight up in his hand. It it's super funny. <laughs> But also his arms up. I, we joked about it earlier. Like, oh. He's like, draw me like one of your French apes. Like it's just so. But he has. You can see a very clear split in yeah. his arm. Yep. Um, where it looks to be broken and the skin is split. Uh, there's matted what looks to be bloody fur on his chest and head, 
and one of his eyeballs is gone, and the other is popped out. I, this is inappropriate, and we'll get into what likely happened to this alleged ape man. But do you think the only reason he caught the Sasquatch is because he caught him? He was lacking because he was jacking. You know? Do you think he was just like, oh shit? <laughs> <laughs> it's like there's uh, in archaeologists discovered in Pompeii. There's yeah. the one guy who's in crusted and ash that look he's just like on his bed just jerking it and it's real funny looking but hey if a, if a volcano was exploding in the backyard i'd probably do the same honestly. i just love the idea that there's also you know like romantic skeletons and a lover's embrace and one dude who's just like i gotta go i gotta go i gotta go <laughs> he came and went um, <laughs> there's gonna be a cut there so <laughs> you're gonna cut that joke out that was funny um so of course, it starts picking up more and more media buzz, and people are like, this dude's got a fucking Sasquatch in a box. <laughs> so people start prodding questions, asking him about it. Yeah. And they're like, well, how did you even get your hands on this? And he was like, well, uh, an eccentric billionaire in California gave it to me on loan for me to do this tour. Um, and a lot of people immediately took that and ran, and they're like, it's uh, actor Jimmy Stewart. It's 100% actor Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. Do you think it was Jimmy Stewart? I don't know. Well, we'll get into if that's even a true part of the story. Yeah, but, you know, it's, of all of the eccentric, I would imagine that it would have been like, oh, I don't, that feels like a, would, yeah, Orson Welles had money by then. That yeah. feels like a Orwellian thing to do. Or Orwellian, listen to me. George Orwell. <laughs> I've made a huge mistake. George Orson Welles. George R. R. Olson. Um, so he was like, yeah, he, this guy just hired me to take this around the country. I don't, I don't know a whole lot about it. Um, and then he started getting into legal issues where people were like, are you saying that's a dead body in there? And he's like, well, yeah, it's this ape creature slash Neanderthal. And they're like, he actually got arrested at Canadian Customs for transporting a cadaver across country lines well yeah because i mean what do you even do is the canadian customs agent when that guy comes up he's like so what do you uh, what do you got in the truck and he's like um it's a it's a sideshow attraction okay cool what is it is it like a you know a three-headed snake or what is it it's like oh it's a um well it's a guy it's a what? It's a guy. Yeah. No, it's a, no. It's like a. It's a. Oh, it's like a strong man. No, no. Oh, like the tattooed guy. No, no. It's um. He's in ice. You gotta. Wait, is he dead? Oh, okay, oh, you yeah. gotta open that fucking <laughs> truck. Are you kidding? He's got a dead guy. So, uh, people start getting more and more interested in it, and to where two uh, zoologists are like, we gotta, we gotta investigate this. Like, there's this man claiming that this is either an ape creature. Or a Neanderthal, like, we have to figure out if this is true. I will say that this would actually be a pretty good way, the like, cover, to be a serial killer. So there, um, the people who made that Cropsey documentary also made a really good one about modern serial killers. And it reveals that most of them are on Long Island, which is mm -hmm. not much of a shocker. Yeah. But a lot of them are truckers, and they operate over state lines. And they are hard to catch, because even if you were to catch them, uh, trying somebody across state lines with extradition and all that can be an issue. Uh, so that's how they get away with it. And this feels very much... Uh, did you ever watch Dexter? Yes. Remember the ice truck killer? Mm -hmm. This feels very much like if Dexter was the ice truck killer in the 50s. Like, what is that? Oh, that's Sasquatch. <laughs> like, it's always a new dead body. It's kind of like a really morbid take on Boba Fett. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's, it's like Carbonite, kind of. Um, <laughs> well, that's what Darth Vader did to Han Solo. He just fucking froze him. Han Solo's eye, his blood vessels, like, explode in his eyes. He just freezes him. He's like, oh, that's not Carbonite. That's just ice. He's dead. <laughs> that's just, I just froze the fucker. I did not like him. Drop him down the chute. <laughs> it just opens up and it falls out of bed. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, the, I know you really want to get back to the story, but you know the, the like... You've, and now we're going to talk about Joe Dirt, but you know the uh, meteorites? Meteorite. Yeah, but it's just on Solo. It's this is my ice. best friend. That's oh. a chunk of frozen poop. <laughs> I want to see the slow-mo guys plus um, those dudes in Australia with the giant tower that drop things. I want to see him drop a, a, a frozen oh, body. <laughs> see what happens when he hits the pavement. No, yeah. drop it on the trampoline. I want to see it at the trampoline. <laughs> okay, anyway, back to the ape man. So these two zoologists come out and they take a look. And they spend three whole days just inspecting this this creature in ice. It is worth pointing out that they were cryptozoologists. One was a cryptozoologist. One was a regular zoologist. Yeah, I know. But yeah. there are also doctors that tell you to take ivermectin. You yeah. know what I mean? There are also gonna bleep dentists that, that call just themselves gonna say doctors. Horse paste across my mouth because that's definitely going to get us demonetized. Yeah. Please like and subscribe. So they spend three whole days uh, just 
taking measurements, uh, looking at it, taking samples. Uh, although they can't take many samples because it's still frozen in this big block of ice. Yeah, and it's also behind a piece of glass. And uh, Frank's reasoning for that was that it smelled absolutely atrocious, mm -hmm. um, which is consistent with both dead bodies of humans and live bodies of Sasquatches. Yes. It comes up all the times that they're real stinky bastards. Do you think we don't see them because... They're just really embarrassed about how stinky they are. They're, Do you think yeah. that's why humans are weird about body odor? Because we don't really have a reason to be weird about it. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't think it stinks. So it's funny that so many people kind of naturally go towards that. Do you think yeah. that's a reaction? Sasquatches were like, we're not stinky. And there was a huge Ooh, fallout between weird. the two types. Uh, well, they actually got to witness the stench firsthand. While they were investigating it, they put up uh, lamps to oh, try to see right. it better. Yeah. And they dropped one of the lamps on the piece of glass, and it cracked it. And they said as soon as that grass, glass cracked, the smell of rotting meat just filled the air and made them absolutely disgusted. Yeah, well, I mean, that is... Because even if it was... I have a slight quandary to that. Much like Goof of the Day, which I mentioned in the headlines, mm -hmm. we also have the garbage question. My yeah. favorite question to ask somebody. Here's a... Feel free to leave your answer in the comments. This is how we judge the character of people. Yes. Theoretically, you have to eat garbage. It's like what Heathcliff eats, you know, like fish bones and newspapers and shit. Do you eat it hot? Do you eat it cold? Those are the two answers. You don't know ifs, ands, or buts. I don't want to hear that shit. Do you eat it hot or do you eat it cold? There is a wrong answer. And I'm going to wait for you to leave your answer in the comments before I say it. It's hot. It's hot. Have you ever been in like a big city or around a trash can when it's hot outside, it's disgusting smelling. When it's cold, it definitely smells less. You know, like freezers, right? Like yeah. freezers don't smell all that bad, even when they have a lot of meat in them for a long time. <sighs> right? Like I hesitate. Yeah. I wonder why it would smell so bad. I know that I'm not trying to distract from the story here, but I just wonder why it would smell bad if it wasn't a Sasquatch that was already just a stinky mink. Yeah. I don't know that you, I don't know, it would have to smell so incredibly bad to be able to smell it through the ice. Yeah. I don't know, maybe there's a, like a biologist listening to this that could explain this to me better or link me to a YouTube video about what happens to your body when it freezes. But I just feel like at some point, especially that tissue being frozen that long, you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, so yeah, they broke the glass at one point and it did really reek. But the, the, these dudes are puking everywhere. <laughs> they finished their investigation. It's like the pie eating scene from Stand By Me. And uh, Sanderson, one of the, the scientists, releases an article in April of 1969, nice, that <laughs> says, is this the missing link between man and apes? And he went on, like, one of the big things that uh, Frank Hansen said, he was like, hey, I'll let you guys investigate this, but don't tell anyone. Yeah. Like, he I want to keep this to was me. Like, yeah, because he very much... We will get into it here in a little bit. I apologize for interrupting, but... He has the most plausible story about having a Sasquatch I've ever heard. Yes. Because every one of those questions like... Three stories, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, why wouldn't you do X? Why wouldn't you do Y? He does X and Y. He does everything you're supposed to do. So yeah. like, he calls these doctors and he's like, hey, can you please come take a look at this thing? But you can't fucking tell anybody. Yeah. Because if you do, it's going to be a problem. And then they immediately tell everybody. Yeah. And it becomes an on, enormous problem. They go on the Tonight Show. <laughs> uh, they want to send people from the Smithsonian out to look at it. The FBI catches wind, and they uh, are contemplating whether or not they're going to investigate it. And finally, uh, John Napier, he's a primatologist, goes to investigate it, and he looks at it, and he's like, what is this? And he goes with Sanderson, and Sanderson is like, this isn't what I looked at. He's like, this isn't the same thing. Where's the one that you showed me? And uh, John Napier, he's, he's like, this is clearly just some sort of like decoration. And Hansen goes, oh, well, uh, the California owner, he told me with all this media buzz, it was probably safer to send it back to him. Um, we got a replica made, and that's what I'm going to have on display now. And he did legitimately have a, rec a replica made. He had mm -hmm. a replica made by a, a very prominent... Uh, uh, like animal sculptor, they were. I believe they were making elephants for an amusement park. Uh, it's for the La Brea Tar Pits. Yeah, for the Tar Pits. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah, they were making the the elephant uh, maquettes and statues for that, um, and then they were brought on. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So he um, decides to get this thing made, and he goes to the guy who's making the elephants for the La Brea Tar Pits, and he sculpts a body in the same exact position and everything, and casts it in latex. Well, he then sends them off. Um, to another couple, uh, their last name is Carol, 
who were really big into making wax sculptures. And so they hand planted each individual hair into this latex dummy. And he's like, it's pretty accurate. They then took it to another guy who added makeup to it, matted some of the fur with fake blood, did the whole eye thing. Yeah, replicated the head wound and the arm wound. Um, but it wasn't 100% accurate. No. Uh, which we'll get into that here in a bit. But yeah, so he even has receipts. He's like, I spent about $60,000 getting this thing made. He's like, but I still wasn't making money off of it. Well, and he did it. He had it made because he was worried as the word had gotten out and the FBI was interested and everybody was uh, taking a look at it. He wanted, to, he even, uh, in later in 69, he would go out on to cancel his tour. Yes. And be like, I'm not doing it anymore. This mm -hmm. isn't making me any money. That's probably where you were about to go. Oh, yeah. Apologize. But yeah, he had made it abundantly clear that he had replaced it with a vinyl replica and it was because he was terrified. He was legitimately scared. Now, obviously, the question in there is, was it always a vinyl replica that was just very convincing um, and now he had a great story to tell so he was just adding Adding uh, fire to the flames, maybe, yeah. but it really does seem like he was frightened that he was going to get in trouble. Yeah, and he was like, you know, I, I've spent thousands of dollars, some of it even borrowed from other people to make this model, and I like, I just don't, I can't do this anymore. So what he did is he got a friend in Pasadena, and they made it look as close uh, to the specimen in the freezer as possible. And then they were like, all right, hey guys, put out articles. Yes, it's the same one, um, or it's the same thing, but it's a different creature. This is a fake creature. We, we protected the old creature. There's some funny stories about them freezing the dummy. Yeah. Uh, they went to a place in LA that was an ice company at eight, eight in the morning. And they like talked to the people on the phone. They're like, hey, we have this, like, Bigfoot dummy that we want to encase in ice. Is that okay? And they're like, yeah, no problem. Bring it down. And they're out there and they're pulling it out of the back of his station wagon. And the guy that owned the company walked past and he's like, where are you going with that thing? <laughs> and they're like, oh, well, we rented a storage room for a few days. We're going to freeze it in a block of ice. The guy goes, in our company? No, you're not. <laughs> he's like, get that thing away from us. The reason was it was a food processing plant. And he's like, if we froze that in our processing plant and a government agent came yeah, in. Dude, imagine having to explain that. Imagine it like a hair making its way into a can of beans. And they're like, <laughs> they're like, um, excuse me, what's this hair in my beans? And they're like, well, um, it's Sasquatch's hair. It's a hard thing to explain. He then finds a private company that just recently went under but was still in operation to finish out some of the orders they had for large ice, like large scale ice. They were able to freeze it. They built a refrigerating like chamber. They put it back on display. And by May, um, they were able to do its circuit again. They were like, we're out and about. And people were like, whoa, how did you get it? Because it was a what is this type show. Like, look at this crazy thing. What do you think it is? And people were like, where'd you get this? And that brings us to the first of his many stories. Yeah, because I think that is probably the question that's on everybody's mind, which is, okay, real or fake, you know, if this thing was real and it really was replaced, where did he get it in the first place? Because, you know, the story about an eccentric billionaire loaning it to him is obviously mm -hmm. bullshit. So that was his first story was he said that this was thousands of years old uh and some the story kind of changed a bit it was either russian sealer vessel or a japanese whaler vessel hit something as they're sailing through the ocean and they they throw a net and they pull up this six thousand ice man pound, dead ahead <laughs> six thousand pound block of ice with this this creature frozen inside of it they get to dock the chinese government confiscates it does all these tests stores it in a deep freeze plant in Hong Kong, and this eccentric California billionaire finds out and was like, I would like to buy that. The Chinese government are like, you would like to buy this? Here you go. The, the, the billionaire is like, you know, I don't have time to show this to the world. How about I hire this guy that shows a really old tractor? <laughs> so the biggest fault in this theory to me is that uh, China didn't open its borders to domestic or international trade until 1972. So mm -hmm. when did he pick this thing up? You know what I mean? Like it yeah. feels so Indiana Jones. It's like 
I got it in Shanghai in the back of a shop. It feels like um, I l- I really love Gremlins as a movie, but it's like a little bit offensive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the when he goes and gets the Mogwai, which means a little devil, by the way, when he goes and gets the Mogwai, uh, I think it's you know that little shop that feels like where this would have happened. But yeah, I just don't. That one doesn't feel as possible to me. Yeah, I, I just it, that feels like a fun story because keep in mind the reason there are so many stories is because. Uh, it was a that's what he sold right like he was a showman so yeah. it probably had different stories depending on the crowd he was selling it to um, our job I guess our job our task today is to decide which one we think is most plausible and I just don't think that an eccentric billionaire probably owned it what do you think uh, no, that is the least likely of the three stories right um, the the second most likely uh, in my opinion you might differ from me <laughs> is the We're one do a mini tier list inside this podcast he ended up writing his own short story about his experience. Yeah. Uh, it was called I Killed the Ape Man of Whiteface. Yeah. And it is the story about, um, we'll, we'll put a link to it in the description yeah. if you want to yeah. read the whole thing. Of course, I'll just paraphrase it. Um, he went out with a hunting party one uh, November morning. It was him and a couple of buddies from the military. And he gets separated from the group. Like, they all split off to their separate places. And he is sitting there, and he, he sees a doe. He sees a doe sitting there. And so he fires at it, gets a, gets a kind of clean shot, but it takes off running. If you've ever been hunting, you know that's not an uncommon thing. Yeah, that's pretty much how it works. Um, so he ends up tracking it, following the blood trail, and it goes into this not-so-frozen swamp. Like, it's Minnesota in November, so it's kind of cold, kind of yeah, snowy. Sleet, yellow grass. But uh, once you get to the swamp, that swamp holds a lot of uh, its heat because swamp gas, you know, the thing that caused most UFO sightings. <laughs> uh, but the snow starts to melt, so he has a harder and harder time tracking this deer. So he ends up walking for about an hour and a half and gets to this clearing in the swamp where he hears this, like, gargling sound he's super concerned and he's like well maybe i i hit it in the lung and it's just asphyxiating yeah. uh so he gets to this clearing he goes past a tree and he sees these three brown furry creatures and he's like oh they're bears i should be careful he squats down and as he squats down one of the he gets a closer look he realizes they have human hands and they're eating this deer those aren't bear hands they're Bare hands. Bare hands. <laughs> and they start eating this deer, and he uh, tries to get a better look, and he drops a compass that he had on him, and one of them looks up at him, and he realizes, oh, that's like a person. He's like, it's, yeah, it's covered head to toe in fur, but its face is bare. It's that's got human hands. Chewbacca. It starts gunning towards him. <laughs> so he's freaking out. His heart's beating. He's trying to run backwards away from this thing. And he has his hunting rifle, and he's able to just... He says he doesn't quite remember to do it, but he just fires off a shot, and it hits it in the body. And it said it kind of winces, but it really doesn't face it all too much. He said it, in the moment he didn't really remember, but apparently he reloaded his gun, fired again, and just took off running. And he didn't know exactly what happened, but he kept running and running, thinking these things were chasing him. He kept falling, picking himself back up, falling again. He finally gets to a spot where it's covered with trees, and he sits there, and he's like, I don't know where I am. (laughs) He pulls out the compass that he dropped. It's busted. It doesn't work. And he's like, I don't don't know what to do. Dude, what a situation to be in. Like... We talked about it last week, uh, and obviously this is where the sightings are going to kind of uh, commingle. But there's one of the stories from last week about the soldiers being in the middle of a battle mm-hmm. with VC soldiers, and there being rock apes in the middle, and everybody just stopping. This feels like that. Yeah, it's a similar type of vibe because he's just goes through this thing, and he's like, you know, a pretty capable guy. He's a pilot. He was in the Air Force. He served. Yeah, and he's now he's lost in the woods in his you know in his home woods. That's pretty terrifying, you yeah. know, to feel like you're legitimately lost in your own backyard. Uh, but luckily, there's a thing... Also, he just shot an ape man in the face. <laughs> there's a thing with hunters. Uh, if you fire three rapid shots in the air, that is a signal to say, hey, yeah, I'm a hunter, SOS, yeah. I'm in danger. And usually the response is to shoot uh, three more in succession so you can walk towards the gunshot so you know where other people are. So he does that, he waits, he hears... He makes his way towards it, shoots three more, hears the response, 
finally makes his way to another group that's hunting. And he's like, hey, I got lost. Um, he's keeping the experience real close to his chest. He's like, I got lost. I don't know where my group is. And they're like, oh, what group are you with? And he's like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, the one driving the green truck? He's like, yeah. And he goes, we saw the green truck parked over here. Come with us. <laughs> so they took him back to his group. And they're like, oh, there you are, Frank. Where you been? And he's like, oh, I got lost. I'm sorry. And he hands the compass back to the guy uh, that gave it to him. And he's like, hey, this isn't worth, like, it's weight and gold. Like, it's, <laughs> this is it's useless. fucking useless. <laughs> Uh, and the guy goes, are you sure it's useless? Or are you just a white dude that doesn't understand the woods? <laughs> <laughs> Which is really fucking funny. <laughs> yeah, it is. But he, they all then get in the car and start to head home. And he's like, I really want to tell him what happens, but I know I can't. Yeah. I mean, they they already think he's a ding dong. And then he was like, well, so guys, about being lost in the woods. But he starts I writing. an alien. <laughs> uh, he's like, I know that if I start telling them this story... I might get kicked out of the military. Yeah, well, we ran into this when we talk about the Battle of the Big Sky specifically, but we saw it a little bit in Loveland. Speaking of the Swamp Gases, Mm -hmm. that idea, while in Men in Black, comes from the Loveland UFO incident. Yeah. Um, Great episode. Check it out. A lot of those military guys said that they faced a lot of punishment for bringing anything up. There's the one guy, there's an instance of a UFO sighting on the base. It's sitting over a nuclear missile silo hovering and the guy walks over to it and he's like he calls his co and he's like we need help down here and his co is basically like get fucked and he's like are you sure man and then he touches it and gets zapped and they call back and they're like no really we needed help something seriously happened down here they all those guys didn't want to talk i mean even look now with the tic tac footage and Mm -hmm. stuff we we see it a lot with ufos i'm sure with anything else related like that we're gonna see the government putting a lot of pressure on employees not to say anything yeah uh he was like i can't tell him what's going he's like i'm less than five years away from retiring if i tell him this story they might deem me unfit to fly and like discharge me and he's like i don't want to deal with that and that can affect his ability to get a license outside of the military too um, yeah, exactly. And so for the next like month, he's just constantly struggling with this. And he's like, you know, I, I have to get some peace of mind. I have to go back out there. So he loads up his hunting dog and his hunting buggy. And he goes back out to the woods, tries to retrace his steps, makes some lucky lucky turns at some splits in the road. Well, and he waited for it to snow as well. Yeah. Because he figured once it snowed, it's going to be a lot easier to track it when I come back across it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's like, plus I can easily find my way back to my buggy if I find it, if I can see my footsteps. Yeah, I'm going to share that quick anecdote that yeah. I shared with you earlier today. My dad's going to hate this. <laughs> uh, but my dad once, we won't get into how, drove his GTO through the front of somebody's house. Uh, and it was pretty early in the morning and his decision to just sort of walk away from it, which, hey, we've all learned that was a bad decision. It was a long time ago. But his decision to just get out and walk away was sort of defeated by the police officer's ability to trace his footsteps in the snow from his door to his front door to not gonna be like sir is that your car in that gentleman's house uh my what i don't know what you're talking about about. and then we devised that he should have had drunk boots you know that were on backwards it always looked like he was walking away from whatever he's walking towards (laughs) but yeah love you dad love you grandpa um so yeah he's like i i just have to go find it get some peace of mind and then i'll figure it out from there because yeah. i don't know if i i killed an escaped gorilla or if i accidentally just shot a homeless dude well, yeah, he, in the woods he made it pretty clear that he was pretty worried he shot a guy yeah um so he makes his way out there and his buggy has no problem getting there he he parks he starts walking and he's like none of this is looking familiar and then he trips over a log and he's like oh and he gets up and he's like Hits the snow a little bit, and it was the beast <laughs> of Jevonon. So he he trips over this log, and he he's like, "What the fuck?" And he dusts some snow off of it, and it's the thing that he shot. He's like, "Cool, so that did happen." He's yeah. like, I, "I I remembered it correctly." This story tells uh, a tale of a very clumsy uh, yet successful man. Yeah, you know, like he accidentally killed this thing. He accidentally found it again, uh, and he's like. Well, I need to get it out of here. Because he's like, I 100% shot this thing in the face. Like, you could see it was covered in frozen blood. Its eye was missing. Yeah, its eye Uh, was hanging out. Its left arm was twisted under the body. uh, And he's like, if someone finds this, they can link it back to me. So he's like, I need to get it out of here. So he calls his dog, gets back to the buggy, drives home. 
and uh, parks the buggy in some bush, gets in his truck, drives home, and he's like, hey, hun, the buggy got stuck. I'm going to need a shovel, a pickaxe, a chainsaw. I <laughs> uh, try to get it out, and she's like, oh, that's fine, honey, blah, blah. He jumps back in the truck, finds the buggy again, loads everything up, goes back to the creature, and just cuts it out of the ice, puts it on the back of the buggy, ratchet straps it down, gets it to his truck, drives home, backs the truck into the garage, and he's like, honey, can I talk to you real quick? She's like, yeah, what's wrong? He goes, so like a month ago, I shot this thing in the face, and I don't know what it is. We need to keep a hold of it. Luckily, we just got that new deep freezer. Let's put it in there. And she goes, but I just got groceries. He goes, hey, listen, uh, my military career is more important than like some five bucks worth of meat. How about you get that out of there so we can put this creature in there? Dude, what a dick. What a dick. I shot this guy and I don't want to get arrested for it. Get the steaks in the fridge. So uh, she puts the kids to bed. Uh, he even writes in his thing, like many military wives, she was accustomed to adjusting to unforeseen and unpredictable circumstances. Which was just a really polite way of uh, domestic abuse. Oh, 100%. Uh, she said, we put our three children to bed, waited until they were asleep, and then, with the use of the straps, dragged the carcass of the creature into the basement. <laughs> carcass. Uh, they end up putting it in the freezer and just leaving it there until they could figure out what to do with it. And that's where they get the idea. To put it on display. Yeah. So that's the second story. That's the one that I think is the most credible. Yeah. That's probably, that's maybe the most likely story, but it's the least acid cat story. Yes. Um, and the most acid cat story is the third story. Go so for I'm it. Gonna, yeah. I'm going to switch into Top Gear here. So yeah, uh, last week we talked a lot about the rock apes, uh, the Bata Tat Ujit of uh, Cambodia and of Vietnam, and we talked about that because... The third story today is that Fred Hansen, while he was a pilot in Vietnam, snuck one of these Sasquatches out. It got shot uh, by servicemen, uh, maybe him, maybe not, and was then subsequently snuck out. Now, I hear you at home, right? There are a couple things to point out. Um, we wanted to bring up last week's episode before all of this to give a greater frame of reference of where, if a Sasquatch Yeti, what have you, still exists, where it likely lives mm -hmm. and where it has likely lived in the modern age. And I don't really think that is places like northern Minnesota. I don't think it's anywhere that close to people. Yeah. Um, I think plenty of animals have significantly smaller brains and are capable of understanding to stay away from humans. Oh, yeah. And I, I find it significantly more believable that they live in a cave system that's still predominantly unexplored and only started being explored in the 90s. Mm -hmm. You know, so at this time, it hadn't been explored. They were was the first time people were going into that area. So that being said, I find that to be a much, and it's an ancient area where those types of creatures have lived and as we brought up contain natural levels of psilocybin mushrooms that would accommodate the evolution necessary so like it, i i understand that occam's razor i don't know if it's applicable with cryptozoology <laughs> but in this story it tells us that he likely shot this thing in northern minnesota and brought it home yeah but i have a harder time believing that if we accept all that being true, it's likely from Minnesota. I think it's probably from Vietnam. So if that's the case, then the question is, how did he get it back? And that's a really good question. However, uh, dead bodies were typically prepared before they were sent over. That being said, sometimes those vehicles had refrigeration in them, but a lot of times they didn't. It would be pretty difficult to get you could do it. You could definitely sneak something that large through. Um, and that block isn't that much larger than what is considered to be a standard size for an ice block, like an uncut ice block. So I don't find that to be all that unbelievable. Those are usually about 300 pounds. Um, I just have a hard time seeing how they would get it on a boat, you know. But that brings back those memories, right, of, you know, Hong Kong, the, the first story. Mm -hmm. It brings up that idea of the first story of, like, was it uh, clandestinely being held and then shipped out? Maybe. But I, I, I'm I, torn because I find it to be more likely that the ape is from Vietnam, but less likely that it came from the Vietnam War. What do you yeah. think? Well, you posed an interesting theory last week when we were talking about how these could be connected. 
And you were talking about uh, the opium smuggling. Oh, Frank Lucas, yeah, mm-hmm. and the heroin he would bring in. Yeah. And, like, how... Oh, there was a black market. There was, like, a steady black market coming from Vietnam, no question, for sure. And they would they would throw the drugs into the caskets with fallen soldiers, and that's how they'd smuggle it back into the States. Yeah. Who's stopping... Who's stopping him from throwing this six-foot-tall creature, so man-sized creature, into an empty casket with the rest of the soldiers? That's a perfectly fair point. Like, nothing says it was brought back frozen. Yeah. He easily could have frozen it when it got back. Or even just a body bag, not even a, like... Especially because he was the one to put it back into ice, Mm -hmm. you know? So, in theory, the ice could have just been his idea in the first place. There's no outside influence that introduces the ice here. Yeah. When it needed to be replaced, he was like, oh, we should put it in ice. He didn't propose that they should do something else with it, because he knew it was going to be a... a, We didn't talk about this, but that's smart, because he didn't talk about the... He was very candid about how it's fake. Yes. So why is it still in ice? Why is it still under glass if it's fake? Maybe that's just the idea he had. Mm-hmm. You know, he seems like a sort of work that one idea type of guy. Um, and if it did, like, if it wasn't in ice when he brought it from Vietnam back to the States, that would explain when they did crack that glass why it would smell. Yeah. Because rigor mortis would already, Rick and Morty, uh, would <laughs> already set in uh, and it would start to release methane. And that. It, that process we, is actually called pickle Rick. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's when you uh, formaldehyde a body. Oh, my mistake. Yeah. Um, so if you look like at you a, just, you just formaldehyde as a verb. <laughs> when you formaldehyde a body, because uh, you have to formaldehyde the stench, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was gonna say. That's what Agent Forty Seven is actually doing. He's formaldehyding the bodies. So if you look at a lot of the pictures, which it's kind of hard to come by, a lot of the pictures because a lot of stuff is immediately copyrighted when. It comes to any picture of Bigfoot, yeah. not not nec- not anything well, different from the Minnesota Iceman. Yeah, yeah, it's worth money. Yeah, but the ice has a ton of tiny bubbles in it. Yes, it does. And if you uh, ever like submerge something in water, if it holds a lot of gas or it's producing a lot of gas while it's freezing, the ice is going to have a ton of tiny bubbles in it. That's true. If you we know a thing or two about ice. Yeah. Uh, if you want to get nice clear ice, you want need sublimation to occur, which means that the water goes directly from um, liquid to vapor. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, that's ideal or yeah, or from vapor to solid, sorry, because it because it's the other way around. Anyway, it doesn't trap the the atmosphere. It doesn't trap the atmosphere. And so if you had something that That's a really good point. I didn't even think I think so much about ice. Yeah. And I didn't think at all about the lack of clarity in that ice. The thing that stuck out to me, not we'll get to it in a second so that we, you can finish your thought, but uh, is that they have nobody has tested the ice. Yes. You could very easily tell where the water came from. Like the, I know we said that the first story is pretty bunk, and we're pretty biased on that, but that story seems really bunk. But it would be very easy to debunk, to yeah. be like, well, is that Russian water that's frozen there? Is it salt water? Yeah, what is it? if it's it? frozen salt water, it would show up that it had a salinity content, yeah. but if it's tap water from Minnesota, it's not going to be that salty. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so there's a ton of air bubbles in there, so my thought was, if you put a decomposing body in a vat of water and you freeze it, or you put it in a cooler and you fill it up with water in a deep freeze, as that body's releasing methane, those tiny methane bubbles are going to get trapped, that's going to cause there to be not super clear ice. And you know what else that would do? It would stink when it gets busted. Yeah, it would. It would stink as it melted because it would finally release it. Because the methane, you know, it'll just sit in there in stasis until it's released. Exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. That's why, you know, we joke so much on the show about when they find, like, the ancient frozen worms or, you know, like when a city resurfaces or something. It's like, stay the fuck away. Yeah, put it back. Well, because, like, it's the, some of the scary stuff about climate change is we might have to deal with the Black Death again. Because there is still definitely Black Death under some of the ice in Siberia. It could come back again. Um, Man, what a fucking... You thought COVID was bad. I know we're way past the headlines, but that just reminded me. It rained for the first time ever in recorded history in the ice caps in Greenland. Uh-oh. Yep. Uh-oh. Trouble's yep. coming. Uh, but yeah, so then we get to... What, like you said, why would he freeze the dummy? Yeah, if because you know you could definitely prepare it. It's a dummy. You could just be like, "This is what it looked like. This gives you a better view. Like, put it in a fake, you know, put it in a, a glass case that looks like ice or something. Put it in urethane resin. Yeah, like yeah. cast it in resin, but it's still very much ice. And 
the now owner of it, which I guess we should get into that. Yeah, so yeah, what, what did happen to it? So yeah, after Hanson died, it bounced around a lot. Uh, there's kind of dark history, and then it was with 2013? Yeah, uh, Hanson died in 2003, yep. and then it just, for 10 years, just bounced around, went from like sideshow to storage container to all sorts of weird things. A weird circus to weird circus. And then finally in, in Sokovia. <laughs> 2013, it pops up again. Uh, and it pops up where? Um, eBay. Yeah, where, where everything yeah, pops where up. Where everything pops up. <laughs> um, and Steve Busty, he had been searching for it for the 10 years ever since Hanson died. And he's searching eBay one day and it pops right up. It's just the, just the rubber um, figure. And he's like, I need to buy it. So he looks at the listing. It's $20,000. He buys it instantly. And he now has it. On display uh, at the Museum of the Weird in yeah. Austin, Texas. It's, yeah, it's his in museum. Downtown Austin, yeah. Um, but he also has it in ice. Yeah. He refroze it in ice. He has it in a replica of the uh, glass coffin, the refrigerated glass coffin. And he's like, it's a very important thing, and I want to show it off. But he's like, I know it's fake, but I'm wondering if it's always been fake. And so that's kind of the question I want to ponder at the end here. Has yeah. it always been fake? I don't think so. I don't I think, either. I don't know what it was, but obviously, you know, this is the As a Cat Spirit Hour. We are not here to be entire cynics. We definitely believe in the impossible. Um, I like to think that it is. I I wonder how he got it. I don't, like I said, I am more prone to believe that it came from Vietnam. Yeah. I think it came from Vu Kang. I think it's, because I think it's interesting that we have so many of these sightings um, and none of them managed to take one down. And this one sounds like he got caught jerking. Yeah. You know? So I think maybe they did manage to get <laughs> superiority over one of these apes and, and take it down. More so than he did probably in the woods. Because like yeah. all the other stories we hear about him, if it was that easy to take down a Sasquatch, why don't we have them everywhere? If you could drop one with your forty five while you're hunting, yeah. I feel like it would be... We would hear... Because his story is not dissimilar. Like his... A chance occurrence upon them is not dissimilar from other ones we hear, including the ones from Vu Kang from the Vietnam War. And those mm -hmm. guys had M sixteens in their hands. It's not like they, they had grenades. They had like shotguns. They had weapons that are significantly more deadly in close quarters than that rifle is. Yeah. And they couldn't take one of these down. And you have a group of ten guys from two different militaries who all agree on what they saw. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a hard time believing that some dink dong in fucking Northern Minnesota, who's half a soldier, managed to shoot a hole in its head. I think it probably got shipped in from Vietnam. I yeah. think he probably. I think somebody else probably killed it. I think he probably snatched it. And I think the reason he was so quick to get rid of it, instead of being like, "Well, you know, I'll fight a legal battle," is I bet he stole it from off a of base in Vietnam and knows he stole it off a of base mm -hmm. and uh, was immediately like, "Oh shit, I gotta get rid of it. I gotta get rid of it right now because if I don't get rid of it, I'm gonna end up in fucking Area 51." Yeah. Because I mean postulate that right like imagine one of these teams you know the 101st infantry third grader ninth division you know left wing hut, hut team. yeah guys imagine if they manage to take down one of these things and they've got it in a box and the you know they're scrambling a team to come figure it out and he's like oh shit i'm getting i'm taking that because he was obviously an opportunist yeah the guy made his career off of opportunities oh, he stayed 100%. you know he stayed with the one job he had and then when he didn't have that job anymore he looked for easy opportunities he wasn't out digging ditches he wasn't a contractor that's not what he was doing yeah. he wasn't really doing honest work so i don't have a hard time believing that he would have just snatched it off a base or uh, while he was over there oh not at all yeah so i don't know i'm not really sure but i don't think it was fake the whole time i because if you you can look at them now the dummy compared to the older photos i mean i would be more inclined to be like well you can't really trust those photos but they're from the late 60s it's yeah. not you know and we landed on the moon then, huh? allegedly. Yeah. We land, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. if we could land on the moon, we can take a de decent photo. So I don't, I don't know. I just, I think that he probably did originally uh, have something, and I think he knew more about it than he let on. And I think it was easy to hide behind a veil um, of smoke, given what he does for a job. But my final hypothesis is, I think he snuck it off. Uh, when he finished up his tours in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I think he snuck it out of Vietnam. I think he brought it to the US. I think that's when his wife saw it. And I think I think there's some timeline fuckery. Yeah. Yeah. I think that 
it's easy to make a lie into the truth if you change the timing of things. You know, so I mean, look at what's happening with Ukrainian Christmas. Yeah, you know, it's really, really easy to do that. So I hope that it was real. Yeah, absolutely. And based on evidence alone, those photos are very different. The thing now looks very different, and in ways that wouldn't necessarily have changed. Like the mouth is very different. Yeah, the know? mouth uh, in the original photos, the mouth is closed and almost like a painful wince. Um, now the mouth is. Open, uh, like grin bearing, like you can see like, teeth. Yeah, like full, like pulled back, like lips. snarled almost. Yeah, it's it's. I think it's a little too exaggerated to be real. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously it's not real, right? But you know what I mean. And in the original photos, while it did talk about how one eye was popped out and the other one was missing from the gunshot, it almost looked like its eyes were like closed as well. Yeah. Where the new one, it's very exaggerated. In the one eye being missing, the other eye being popped out. It's very, it looks very Halloween-y. Like, you know, all the latex masks and stuff they sell where it's clearly a dark brown uh, latex that they put into the mold and then they dry brush like a lighter brown over the top of it. Yeah. That's exactly what it looks like. It is what it looks like, yeah. It looks like a, yeah, like a single color paint job. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like the wounds. The wounds are not entirely consistent with Fred's story about hunting it and his story, while poetic, like I said, we'll link to it, um, isn't all that informative or all that trustworthy. And, you know, the fact that the first thing his friend said when he got out of the woods was that he was a putz, yeah. you know, that kind of makes me wonder if <laughs> he can really be a trustworthy narrator. Like, I feel like I wish we could talk to some of his Air Force buddies about yeah. this and be like, is he full of shit? Because, you know, they immediately would be like, yeah, he's full of shit. Or yeah. they'd be like, he stole that thing. And they didn't say shit about it because they didn't want to get in trouble. Yeah, because he was very aware of the trouble he could get in for having that thing. Oh, 100%. I think he stole it. I think he stole it. I think that's the whole story. But you guys tell us what you think happened. Leave your uh, comments. Let us know. Uh, Caleb, do you have a riddle? I do. So last week's riddle uh, was what has a head, a tail, is brown, and has no legs. Um, It's a penny. It's a penny. I thought it was Morris from Shang-Chi. The cutest headless animal I've ever seen. Uh, this week... All the other ones have been dead. Uh, I am not alive, but I grow. I don't have lungs, but I need air. I don't have a mouth, but water kills me. What am I? Leave your answers in the comments, guys, along with anything you might want to add about the story or what you think about the story. I think it's an interesting one. Do check out the previous episode if you didn't before this one. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you next week. We love you guys. Eating rocks, chilling cops. Dude, what is this show? <laughs> like cops? <laughs> no, it's just about male strippers called cops. <laughs> yeah, I've been in the game for about 15 years now. Thinking about retiring soon. Especially because mm. <laughs> yeah, mm. it's always like Fort Lauderdale <laughs> and shit. Reno. They work uh, in the same cities.